for developers and network security. And please, please come and fit these seats here because the presentations are about to start. And you can use the take the laptop with you and here's some wireless network connection available. Uh, the first presentation will be given by Laura Murray from Architect Museum. She's the vice president of the development platform. And she will be talking about Open Web 2.0 from the network perspective, which is interesting, it's kind of a bit different approach, and about how to engage the developers and how to get great applications out uh, to utilize the new uh, possibilities out there. So, first, please, please come and fill the seats here, you guys, all the innovation area guys and others. You can use the wireless network. Hello. Please someone push people forward. There are still seats available. Okay, but you can slowly move towards here. Let's welcome Laura. interesting and exciting as possible, feel free to ask any questions that you have. I'm really going to just touch at a high level about how Octelisa is trying to help change the game and change the interaction between network providers and developers. Because we think that there's a lot of developers that have been trying to get access to network services and work with carriers to build interesting applications, but there are a lot of challenges and hurdles. We'll go through some of those challenges today and talk about how we might be able to help fix that. And what we're looking for really is to get your feedback on what Alcatel can do to, uh, to do that. We'll also look a little bit out into the future and talk about where things might go and where the opportunities exist for you as developers. And there's a couple of things that I wanted to show. We had done some interviews uh, with a couple of developers and I wanted to be able to share those with you. So I'll just take one, one minute here and we'll so this is Dave, you're going to see Dave McClure. Uh, Dave McClure is, you made it, who's heard of Geeks on a Plane? Anybody seen Geeks on a Plane? Do you know Dave McClure? So we've got Dave talking for us, uh, talking about where technology needs to go, where the uh, carriers need to go. We've interviewed quite a few. So those of you that don't know Dave McClure, he is uh, a leading tech evangelist, was one of the original uh, founders of the PayPal team, uh, and then since has gone on to be an investor in a variety of startup uh, entrepreneurs, much like yourselves. And Geeks on a Plane is a group of technical people that drive around, and, or drive around, fly around, obviously, to different countries to attend conferences like this, meet people, talk to people, talk to entrepreneurs to learn more about them. So here's Dave McClure. Uh, Dave McClure, Founders Fund. Excellent. So, Dave, uh, tell me this. Uh, how has your mobile phone application made a significant impact on you? What specific? Uh, so, probably the most significant thing I would say uh, is the ability to do email in bed. In bed? <laughs> How's your wife feel? Much my wife's chagrin, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's sort of a strange thing, um, but I certainly don't think I'm the only person. Um, so it's, it's changed, at least for good or for bad. Uh, you know, my morning ritual uh, is to sort of like flip on the iPhone and check out what's like sort of you know in the inbox uh, before I get out of bed. <laughs> All right. And uh, what what is your mobile phone not doing right now that you'd like it to be doing? Um, Probably payment would be the answer there. So right now, payments on mobile devices is a couple of exercise, and I think that will get better relatively quickly, but that would be substantially different. <laughs> so David, what would you like on your mobile phone? Easy, long payments. Excellent. 
So, um, you know, much like Dave, um, what we've been able to do is go around and ask people what their interest is. And as we've gone around to several um, events and programs, what we've actually done is created what we call our idea wall. So we go and ask developers, what's the future of mobile? What do you think you need? What, what's missing from your mobile device today? Um, who knew a, a year ago, I probably wouldn't have told you that Foursquare was missing from my mobile phone. However, today I now am an, a Foursquare addict and pretty much check in uh, wherever I go. Although I've had a hard time checking in here. I keep trying to, I've tried on both of my phones. I have, I have my iPhone and I have my Blackberry and I can't seem to, to, to uh, check in. How many of you use Foursquare? No? Foursquare is Koala. There's no Foursquare is, so it's a, a game that wherever you go, you kind of, we actually compete with our friends. So the way that uh, my team at, at Alcatel, what we do is every time we travel somewhere, we figure out who can check in the, 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 the fastest and who can become the mayor of the place that we've gone to. The interesting part about Foursquare and how that fits into all of this is if you think about it as an application, there are a couple key components that it uses. Right, Foursquare uses location, it uses presence, does anyone want to know who, who's there around you? Both of those items are things that you can get from a carrier, or you can get them from an over-the-top player. Right? Then the other piece of it is, you get an advertisement. So I was at an um, event in uh, Las Vegas called CTIA. Uh, when I was at that event, I went and checked into my hotel, and I got a, a coupon for a glass of champagne at the bar. Right, so that's a nice little advertisement. Combine those three things together, you get a social game that actually allows you to make revenue off of it as a developer. Now, where the challenge comes in for you as a developer, right, is that you've got two key components that cost you money today. Location and presence. And to get those sometimes cost you money. And so what we're trying to do is get the folks in the telecom industry to think a little differently. How do you rewrite that? How do you make it so that the developer and yourself can share money on that advertisement versus actually having you to have to prepay on your pocket, which then creates issues for you as an entrepreneur because you don't have a lot of money to get started with. So we'll talk about some of those things as we go through this. But the whole point of this innovation wall and this innovation concept was to ask developers, what are the things that you need in the future from the network carriers that you don't have today that aren't over the top? So, where did we start? We start by saying it's all about you. It's all about the developer. Even the venture community, whether it's Dave McClure or whether it's Fred Wilson, who's also from Union Square Ventures, they're looking at startups and startup entrepreneurs that have actually built applications that are going to be the next Twitter or the next Facebook. Right? So, have you, you guys know the stats with Twitter, right? 80% of all of Twitter's traffic comes from their APIs. Right? Those APIs are being used by third-party developers. Does anybody use TweetDeck? TweetDeck? Twitterific? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, you know, those are all apps that have been created by third parties, and that's the environment that needs to be created. To me, that's the same environment that needs to be created by the carriers. So again, kind of our mission is like, how do we go out and get the network to be a platform? because I think that's where the opportunity is, to get put the, the opportunities in the hands of developers, and anybody that's not thinking that way is going to be left behind. That's not just now, that's also in the future. There are some really interesting stats around the growth of APIs. So I came from, I previously to here, I did, to joining Alcatel, I used to go around and consult on API strategies, but for large enterprises. So uh, Tesco, or Best Buy in the US, uh, Netflix or Love Film, uh, The Guardian, all these people wanting to open up access to their assets to let third party developers like you build next generation applications on top of them. So this is only going to grow because this business is really just getting started. So where are the opportunities? Right? One of the opportunities is, is you. They're, they're growing, right? You guys are growing in numbers. Uh, High numbers. So a few years ago, I think there were 12 million developers worldwide. Now there's about 14 million developers worldwide. And the number continues to increase. There are different platforms, whether it's Facebook or the iPhone platform for you to generate money on. Uh, application growth. There are some numbers there and the opportunities for application. Now the interesting thing is these application growth numbers relate to mobile devices. We like to think about the connected consumer. The connected consumer goes well beyond 
just your handset, right? I've got IP television. I've got the connected car. So I'll tell you since you're shining the connected car today, right? So imagine you're in your car and you want to take your apps with you. So also the notion of portable applications. I've got my app that I've downloaded to my handset. What if I could also then, you know, install that same app on my IPTV? What if I could also install that same app in my car? Then you start thinking about DRM, uh, digital rights management associated with an application, and how you as a developer extend your opportunity in the market, right? So those are mobile application numbers. Imagine, imagine adding on all these other platforms. And I'll tell you, Toyota that's doing this with um, demonstrating the car with Alcatel isn't the only one. I've been talking to Ford Motor Company and General Motors, and a lot of car companies are all looking at, hey, how do we create an app store for our uh, for the developer community to help us reach the consumer and engage the consumer? Monetization vehicles. So how do you guys make money off of apps, right? Yeah, you can go put your app in an app store and charge somebody some money to download it. And, and some of that's going away because you lose some of that money to the, um, to the app store owner, right? There's also another mechanism where you can do things like in-app uh, subscriptions or in-app payments. There's things like advertising and virtual currency are sort of the two largest markets and market segments. And we've been looking at those closely to say, how do you marry the kind of monetization opportunities that you can get today, again, with network assets, right? So if I take ads, so again, think back to Foursquare. If I take advertising and combine it with location, instead of you prepaying for access to that location or paying for location call, what you'll actually do is rev share on the money that you've made from the ad. So there's no money out of your pocket up front. So lots of opportunities. If you think about content and content availability, one of the things that, this, that is the scariest to a service provider and why they're kind of hesitant to open up stuff, what happened to AT&T as soon as the iPhone came out, right? Bandwidth goes like this, right? Monetization goes like this. <laughs> so there's a fine line of, of, of what's going to happen, but yet there's a ton of opportunity and there, it's growing uh, at, at a higher and higher rate. Uh, so there's, there's going to be opportunity here for you as well to, to drive revenue. So I always like to say, you know, what we're really trying to do is get two people at a party to talk to each other that never talk to each other. So you as a developer, we'll call you the geek for a moment, never's really going to talk to the person in the suit that's the carrier because there's, it's just not really a person you really want to go and have a you know, fun conversation with. Maybe, maybe you do. Um, how do you get the two of those to talk together? Well, first it's noting where the similarities are. I always like to say that we're always seeking fame or fortune. <laughs> Right? If you're seeking fame, you're like, hey, I'm in the top 10 apps on the app store. Right? That's my fame. My fortune is, I want to make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year off this application, so I don't have to go work for a real company. I can actually just make my own money by building apps. You know what? Businesses want the same thing. They want money, and they want, they want fame and fortune. They want to make money off of it, and they want to be known for their brand. So fame is their brand. It's the same thing. You both want the same. It's how do you get there together. So what we did to figure out how we might get there together is take a look at how you choose a platform. Now, I used one mobile platform and one sort of web-based platform. So you can take a look at it. If you look at the three key areas to drive interest, it's making sure you've got a large distribution channel, you've got discoverability, and monetization. Those are what you're looking for, right? Those things fly directly back to fame and fortune. Apple and Facebook have done a really good job of that. Right. Now, there are challenges with both of those platforms as well. Um, but let's, let's take a step back and say, okay, for distribution, I need a large community. Uh, I really want to make sure that I can go after a community that needs the applications if I'm trying to make money. Um, may not need a large community if my, if my goal is fame. Um, In-app advertising to cross-sell, again, it's all about distribution of the application. Um, do you have a way within the application to promote other applications? Certification process. Who loves certification? Anybody ever tried to do certification for a Symbian app? Anybody ever tried to do it for a Symbian app? Those used to take like, I don't know, months to do them, and they cost you a ton of money to do certification. And then your certification for Symbian is different than your certification for the iPhone, right? Uh, which is then different than certification for other devices. So, you know, while there's certification and it's standardized, or we think, 
on a single platform, although the rules seem to change often. Uh, what we want to be able to try to do is come up where there's 80% standardization of certification across the board. So what we're tra trying to look at is collect information. We've actually gathered a bunch of data uh, across each of the app stores and um, the certification processes to say, where are the overlaps and how can we drive sort of a unified certification uh, across all of those. And discoverability. Um, discoverability is for your application. How can consumers uh, to find, uh, find what it is? Who's, uh, who's used uh, app uh, position? Position app. App position. It's called position app. Does anybody use that? So uh, up until I think last week it was free. What you actually did is you downloaded it as a consumer onto your, it's, a, it's an iPhone one, download it on your iPhone, and it tells you where in the world what apps are, um, are hot and what apps are hot now, by country, by category, and so it's an application to help guide you to find applications, which I thought was really interesting. So again, discoverability, how do you build it in? How do you build it into, uh, into the system you build? Uh, whether you're on Facebook and you're, you know, allow people to invite other people, uh, right? So being able to say, hey, I want to create some sort of viral effect within my platform that I've created. So how can their network carriers create sort of a viralness within the network if they open up network assets? Um, new applications, making sure those get promoted, like I said, the viral hooks, etc. On the monetization side, I think that's really the important part. In order to make money, you, need, you do need access to the users but you need ways to do it. One of the things that I thought was really interesting uh, that Apple did last week, who knows what Apple did? Something about ads. You have to use their network, right? So you, before you could use other ad networks, now you have to use their ad network because they bought one. Well, they're going right back to where, I shouldn't say it's too loud, well, I'm being recorded, uh-oh. Um, but they're going back to where the network carriers are going. So here the carriers are trying to open up, and yet somebody that now is dominant in the market is actually trying to lock down the market. So there's going to be this happy medium and you're going to see some things shift and change over the next few few years. So I don't think we're there yet. But but really it's about openness. You want to be able to use the monetization channel. If you choose you want to use Smoto or if you want to use um, Modally or if you want to use some other type of um, ad network, you should be able to use it. Or Adlom or whoever it is that you want to use, you should be able to use that network and then be able to measure the monetization associated with that so you can pick it. So one of the interesting things about this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the brief Alcatel commercial just for a second. Um, one of the things that we launched at Alcatel um, about two months ago, on a mobile world conference, was this uh, dashboard. So if you go to Optimize, it's developer.alcatel-lucid.com. You go to the Optimize button, you log in, you register your app. You don't care where your app is, you register your app, put in the app ID, and you can track monetization associated with that app. You can also track um, API analytics with that app. So some of this data, I apologize, is going to be a little, uh, a little old. But you can try it. My ad revenue is broken. Sorry. Um, you can track conversations about the app. You can track the ranking in the app store. So what you do is you go in and register one or more apps, and then you track all this data about it. Uh, the other thing that we've also done is put in uh, general world averages. So for example, if you want to know where you get the most money for ads, voila, you can actually say, oh, I actually want to launch my app in South Africa because <laughs> I can make a lot of money off of ads in South Africa. But, but this is sort of world averages, but what you really want to be able to do is see yourself to others. Has anybody here ever heard of Mint.com? Yeah? So Mint.com is actually more of a, a consumer type application. And what Mint lets you do is you register all your credit cards, your bank accounts, your mortgage, all kinds of car payment, and you go put all your information in there, all your login information, and then what it does is it, it tracks your financial health for you. And then it compares your financial health to other people like you. So what it'll do is say, other people that live in, in, in Madrid, uh, they tend to spend you know, twenty dollars, a, a twenty euros, sorry, a, a day on on dinner, and you're spending a hundred euros a day on dinner, and uh, so what it does is it lets you compare and see how you are doing to other people. Or this month you spent a uh, thousand euros on travel, and last month you spent a hundred euros on travel. So we're doing the same thing with apps, right? So imagine being able to do that with your application, tracking revenue, tracking API statistics, tracking what other people out in the community are saying. This is sort of a first step. 
But this has to do with monetization, right? Because you might be using Smoto, but you might find out that Modally or AdMob actually serves you better as a developer. So again, rethinking how developers get support, how you guys get help. Again, we love feedback on this, so if you guys get a chance to, to look at it later, please, please do. It's my end of my commercial. Um, so there are other hurdles, right? Other than the fact that you need distribution, you need the ways to make money, and you need to be discovered, there are some pretty big hurdles around fragmentation. Those numbers look right? So if you want to develop an application, there are actually 2,000 devices, 2,000 different handsets out there. So if you want to build an app that's custom to a handset, right? okay, uh, anybody own an N97? Oh, it's Nokia's hot uh, device from last year. How many of you own an iPhone? Right, a few of you. So, so again, there's 2,000 different devices that could be <coughs> developed an app for. If you're developing something for a specific app, that instantly narrows your, or for a specific device, that instantly narrows your market down. So having a broader level perspective of application development is going to be important. Or doing some level of device abstraction. Who's heard of AppCelerator, PhoneGap, OpenPlug? You guys heard of these folks? They've all built abstraction layers. Now, they're interesting in their own right. Some of them actually use the, the WebKit. Well, sometimes the WebKit's not the same across devices as well, right? So again, another challenge for you. Then you've got things like uh, OpenPlug has created their own SDK. They'll actually let you use your, um, uh, when, they, when they translate the, um, when they do the compiler, they actually put it into uh, the uh, language on the device uh, so that you don't actually have to worry about it. You can still take advantage of device-specific features. So that's kind of cool. But so there's there's different levels of what you could do out there. But still, that's a huge challenge for you. Um, networks. If you think about carriers worldwide, there's 750 carriers. So let's say I open up an API that lets you identify, I don't know, maybe you're on 2G, 3G, or 4G. As a developer, wouldn't it be really cool to have access to that? Right? You could, in your application, you could actually make the application better by being able to say, Hey, I want. I know I'm on 2G, so I'm going to deliver content in this format. I know I'm on 4G, so I'm going to deliver content in this format. So again, as a developer, if you knew that, that'd be really cool. Now the challenge is, with 750 carriers, every one of them has an API. They're going to open it up. It's going to be different, right? So again, how do you standardize that? The other thing with app stores. So app stores are really interesting. Uh, we talked to some people. They're going to go build an app store. General Motors is going to go build an app store, but yet you got carriers that are getting rid of their app stores, and yet you've got Apple who's got an app store that's doing pretty uh, pretty well. Um, right now there's over 40. Uh, we see that number growing to be about 400 app stores over the next three years. And those app stores, like I said, they're not just going to be for your mobile device. They're going to be for your television, right? They are gonna, they're going to be for the connected car, hence Toyota, General Motors, and Ford. So you're going to see the app store number grow, but again, that means more challenges for you. Why? Certification. <laughs> Metadata management, right? So you have to upload all the data, you have to get it certified, then as it changes, you have to go to each app store. So you're only going to pick a couple app stores. So one of the things that we've been work working on at Alcatel is, is this notion of, um, I'll call it uh, a publishing service, an application publishing service. What you would do is upload your application, right? Get it certified and tested, because we believe 80% of the testing can be the same. You have one place that you manage your metadata, and then you publish that metadata. You say, I want this store, this store, and this store. And it's more of a checkbox, right? So you're automatically publishing it. Think book publisher. I have one place that I go to, and then that publisher sends out that, that application for me. So thinking about where that future is. The other part around the app stores and around device fragmentation, again, if you want that app to be able to go cross platforms, what about who, who uses uh, Linux? Who's familiar with Package, package Manager? Right? You guys probably know that stuff. So imagine if you could have a package manager that actually came along with the app. So when you wrote it, it knew if it was on a mobile device, if it was on a, um, you know, if it was on a DVR, or if it knew it was in the car. So it actually know what platform it was, and then instantly install that. Again, things we're thinking about uh, within the company. We have an organization called Motive that has a product already that does that. We want to plug it into the application environment. So again, thinking about how to solve fragmentation issues. So we've been talking about how do we fix this, right? 
What are we fixing? We want to be able to drive the adoption of the network as a platform by creating monetization opportunities. And the only way we're going to create monetization opportunities is to really fix the fragmentation issues, right? So what we like to say is we're creating the perfect storm. Um, who's seen the movie The Perfect Storm? Anyone seen the movie The Perfect Storm? There you go, right? So what you're doing is you're creating just the perfect environment to have this tornado get created, or in the case it might have been a hurricane, right, created. Um, and, and the notion here is that you've got three players, right? One of those players is an API provider. That API provider might be a retailer, that API provider might be a financial institution, or it might be a network carrier. On the other hand, you've got apps developers. You guys, right? There are things that you want to be able to do. You want distribution, you want to make sure you have ROI, you want to be able to have a better experience yourself for, for developing. And then there's the application end user, because they're the one that's ultimately going to buy your app, they're going to use it, they're going to pay for it, they're the one that you're creating this for. In some cases it's for you, um, but really you're trying to create stuff and create a new experience for the end user. So how do you create that perfect storm? And I think a lot of it is, is finding the right tools, the right, the right technology, the right components. It's going to be having the right business models. It's going to be opening up the right network assets uh, and or assets in uh, a retailer or whomever it might be. But it's creating this environment that, that allows for folks to uh, drive the adoption. So I'll give you one example. Ah. Did I get to the right one? Skipped one. There we go. There's the craziness that I wanted to show you. So you got lots of people trying to build apps. You got a bunch of carriers, right? They all have different specs for their APIs. Uh, they all have different payments processes. They all have you know, different stuff you need to get to. And so if you want to write an app, you have to pick one if you're going to use their network services. Right? If I'm going to use location, unless I use a location aggregator, then maybe I have to prepay or make a commit. Same thing with SMS aggregators, right? So it's an interesting model, there's a lot of challenges, but this is the way the market and landscape looks today. This doesn't even include the whole device fragmentation stuff that we talked about, right? It gets a little crazy. So I like to call this the calm. <laughs> the calm is one of the things that we've been working on is something called the open API service, where you actually, a bunch of developers write to a single API, that single API call, again, this is an aggregation model, but it's a little different play. So what you'll do, right to a single API, and then it runs against multiple operators. Now, what we've done is created prepackaged APIs. So you'll, again, combine that location with virtual currency, or combine that location with ads. So you won't just buy an API, you don't have to prepay for it, you don't have to make a commit, you use the two together. So it's creating sort of the calm along with the right business model that'll make, create success. So, what network resources do you want? What does it mean for uh, the network carriers to, or the um, service providers to open up their network? What I'd like to do is say, you know what, you have to think about disruption. So this is a little bit of an older tweet, but I really liked it and needed to use it because I thought it was great, right? By opening PayPal API, PayPal wants to disrupt their own tech before others do. Right? One of the things that we really need to as a community, right, you as developers, we need to make sure that we're educating carriers, look, if you let us innovate on this stuff, we're really going to help drive adoption of our network. We're going to help you find new revenue streams. Because that's their biggest question. So we just did this webinar a couple, uh, I think it was last, I think it was two weeks ago now. We did this webinar to a bunch of carriers. And what came out of it was the thing that scares them the most about work, opening up network assets is the fact that they don't know what the business opportunity is. They don't know what the business model is. They don't know what you want to use. Right? They're like, ah, oh, location, you can go over the top and use Wi-Fi triangulation, ah, oh, SMS, it's out there, or you can use in-app notifications, or you can use device-based notifications. So they're like, eh, that's one. They're like, what do these guys want access to? Go ask them, right? So again, it's about starting a conversation, making sure that we identify what you guys want. So again, while we're here, I know I want to find out, and Ross is sitting over there, and you may know Ross. Ross used to run the uh, community for SourceForge. He's sitting over there, he's joined us at all to run our developer evangelism program. But what we really want to know is what you want open, right? Again, things like quality of service. You want to know if you're on 2G, 3G, 4G. Uh, there are things like you want access to subscriber data, right? What other things do you want access to? Maybe you actually want to know um, uh, what device somebody's on, right? You want to know if they're on a handset or if they're looking at something on the DVR or if they're looking at something on the web. 
So there are different things that the network providers know that are in the guts of the network that, you know, it would be really cool if we had access to this and it's different. And there's not a way to go over the top. They're the only ones that have it. So, so how is it? And they need to do that and drive innovation around those types of things. We've got a whole laundry list. I think we've identified, it's not a big laundry list. We say it's about, probably about 30 or 40 that are really interesting uh, that we've gone out to folks and talked about, whether it be quality of service, you know, ignore net neutrality for a minute. It's not, maybe you don't change what somebody has access to, but maybe you just know how to change the data that gets sent over based upon what's happening on the network at the time, right? So is there a lot of activity on the network? Can I change the, the format of the message that I send? Can I send the right message? So things to think about. So what? What are the business hurdles? As I said, for a carrier, they really don't know how to work with you. Right? They're like, I want to charge per API call, because every API call puts more pressure to my network. So it's this notion of sort of how can we do a rev share with the carrier around the assets that they have. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting was we did this survey with some developers in the US and got these statistics. And we've been sharing these uh, kind of around the world, going from carrier to carrier, saying, look, they really want rev share, right? <coughs> or you want to pay for call? Who wants rev share? I know I do. I want rev share. Especially, um, especially if I don't have to pay anything out of pocket. Again, a way for you to get the market quicker. But I thought this was really interesting um, because the paper, paper call model has been the one that folks have been trying to use. Um, and then, you know, maybe paper use on the API and receive, receive share of uh, end user revenues, eh, 4%. I guess that's okay. Uh, upfront fees from network provider but receive low share on end user. Who wants an upfront fee? I can't believe anybody has a chance for that. Yes. So the, the biggest one was the rev share, and that's what we're trying to drive people to. So how? How will all of this happen? Uh, how do we create it? Uh, like I said, we've, we've launched this sort of this notion of bundled services. So if you go to, go to the website again, you'll see this concept of prepackaged APIs. I'm going to build an app for healthcare. I'm going to build an app for social gaming. I'm going to build an app for enterprises. Combining, again, network assets with third-party APIs, what we need from you guys is to say, what type of bundles do you, what type of things would you want to bundle together? What do we need from you? Do you, um, you know, do you need, is there more information that you need from location that we can give you? Do you need the network address book? Uh, what can we then combine it with? Other than virtual currency and ads, are there other things that you want to combine with and prepackage them, prepackage them? And I think you're going to see more of that moving forward. And it won't just be, uh, you know, network carriers taking virtual currency and combining it together. As this wide world of APIs opens up, who, who uses Silverlight? Anybody use Silverlight? You guys familiar with Silverlight? Microsoft Silverlight? So when you go into Silverlight now, what they've been doing, did you notice that they started showing APIs that you can get access to from everyone else? So think about this wide world of APIs. Who's heard of Programmable Web? Have you heard of Programmable Web? So there's a website called Programmable Web. It's run by this great guy, John Lesser, a good friend of mine. Programmable Web is a directory of all the available APIs out there in the world. At least everybody that's registered them with him. And there's quite a few. So I think he's got somewhere between 1,700 and 1,800 APIs registered. And he's got them all categorized. Imagine if you could actually take those APIs and bundle certain things together that you want to use as developers. So you kind of have this prepackaged set of stuff that you say, oh, this is what I need to use together. Oh, this is what I need to use together. And the way you monetize them, the way you leverage them was by having that bundle versus going, and what if you had a way to manage your keys? How many API keys do you guys have? Five, 10, 20, right? Every time you go to use a different API, you have to register to get a different key. And then you have to keep track of those keys you have to manage those keys. What if you can have a repository, right? Somebody needs to go build this. I will. You want to build it? I'll let you build it. So we need a repository of keys. But, but again, just thinking about this, this notion of bundled services is going to be really important. And then you're going to pay for one key that goes with that bundle. Again, one way to simplify it, right? Or a key registry of some sort. So one of the first bundled services that we launched was this notion of social bundles. Obviously, we're on the social theme here. But we went to this event called South by Southwest. Has anybody heard of South by Southwest? Big, cool, fun con uh, conference, a little interactive stuff. First part of it's really mostly social gaming, and then it gets into the cool music and film stuff. Um, so we just created social bundles and launched them there um, to get some, some interest and in, in, in uplift. And the way it works, really, is that you as a developer get, depending on the bundle, would get 65 to 75% of revenue. 
Um, then you have 7% that go to a carrier, 3% that goes to us, management fee, hoo hoo. Um, the other remaining 20% gets shared across all the API providers. Again, this is a way for you not to have to pay them directly. You'll share in that other end of space. <laughs> all right, so how does all this hold out over the next one to five years? Again, like I said, I think you're going to see um, <coughs> aggregation of APIs. You're going to see this bundling of APIs. The revenue models will change, but you have to tell people how you want those revenue models to work, right? You kind of are. As you, as you do things, right? So, uh, how many of you um, how many of you have an app that is pay for download? Anybody? How many of you have an app that's subscription? All right. So, so one of the guys that's on our team, he, he's ever heard of Scout? Scout's a social mobile dating hub, and one of the guys on our team used to do biz dev for them, and he said they originally started by doing the you know pay for download for the app, and then they were like, eh, it's not really working. <laughs> So then they went subscription. And why they went with subscription? Because well, they didn't really have to tell Apple at the time. They didn't know. So they were able to make money off the app <laughs> as, as a way to, to kind of get go over the top. But this time it was go over the top for Apple. OK, how many of you use Wi-Fi triangulation instead of location? Wi-Fi triangulation? Anybody? How many people use in-app notifications? Device notifications. Nobody? Couple? Device notifications? So I think right now it's mostly the uh, Android and, and uh, iPhone that have device-based notifications. But if, again, if you think about this type of stuff, right, if those things, right now everybody keeps going over the top. So you're going over the top is trying to tell people, look, we don't want to pay for that. We don't want to pay for that. Or find a different way to pay for that. Or how can I rev share with you on it? Um, and so I think that's kind of your, if people pay attention, they'll learn. Right? They'll learn what you're trying to do, but again, communicating that. And that's part of what these things are. I mean, the reality, I think, you know, uh, we should have here is really, like, bring all these people in, and, and you guys tell them, right, as a mass crowd. You're like, what we need is this, this, and this. And I think that's going to be sort of the important next step. So while, um, <laughs> has anybody ever seen the Steve, uh, Steve Ballmer developers, developers, developers? You guys ever seen that commercial? Um, <laughs> that commercial for Microsoft? I think it's actually awesome. Because it, we, that was 10 years ago. That was 10 years ago. And now you've got VCs saying they're not going to invest in any company unless they've actually thought about the developer platform that they're building. So imagine starting over again today. And what does that mean if I was a carrier just launching today? I mean, I'm going to open up all my network assets. I'm going to open up so I can have Twilio. Twilio, sorry, instead of Twilio competing against me. Or Ribbit, right? VT ended up having to acquire Ribbit. How do you open up all that network and make it available? So I think you're going to see more and more openness coming across the board, and the business models are going to change. The way that you're going to approach them is going to change, and the way that the carriers are going to approach them with you is going to change. So that's kind of where we see things going. Um, lots of interesting stuff happening out there. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to get them motivated to unlock the doors and to drive new models and to really reach out to you because um, it's a different conversation, right? It's it's not the hey, sign this 50-page agreement. I'll tell you when I. When I first joined Alcatel and we went to open up, we've got a sandbox, so the other, the other thing. I'll, t I'll tell you my experience, because you really need to know, right? So we've created this, uh, this sandbox out on the website. So what you can do is you can go try things like quality of service APIs if you want to and see how they work. Um, there's a bunch of other APIs. Uh, there's some locations, some advertising, credit card, other stuff. But it was interesting, because when we went to put this out there, they were like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you, you can't do that. You mean anybody can go access that? That's our intellectual property. Like, oh, but open, openness, like we'll build on the platform, network as a platform. So we literally, what, Ross, how, how many weeks did it take? Three weeks? Three weeks <laughs> before we got the legal team to actually understand that this was a good thing and that it's not intellectual property. Whatever you guys build on it is actually yours. You own it. That's the whole intention. It'll help us drive revenue. So it's really interesting. But it was a good lesson for me. I come from the startup world, right? So you come here and you're like, what? You're worried about IP? No, no, no. They're going to help you build your business. Trust me, that's what developers do. Um, so you know, it's a learning process. And you just have to understand these are old school businesses. It's a learning process. They'll get there. They're trying. All of them, uh, Telefonica, I know. they're here. We've been working with them and, and some other large companies. Uh, they want to do it. They just don't know how to. So a lot of it's you communicating and telling them. All right, that's enough of my commercial. Anybody have any questions? Any questions, comments, thoughts, feedback?
Yes. Yes. So, so the subscriber data, what we're looking at is things like, um, uh, you're familiar with OAuth? Are you familiar with OAuth? OAuth? Do you know what OAuth is? So on the web, there's a, a, a permission-based OAuth. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't have the I don't have a lovely Spanish accent. <laughs> so, um, so OAuth, right? Imagine applying that same model to getting subscriber data, right? A subscriber opts in to let you have access to their data about themselves, much like you have to opt in for location. The other data you might need to provide them are things about uh, everything from what might be, you know, what's their data usage been, right? Uh, maybe it's things about. Um, uh, their current their current billing amount, right? So there are some interesting things like that. But there's other information that they know about you as a subscriber. Uh, there are some interesting things that can be done on the identity side, right? So when we were at South by Southwest, there was a uh, uh, there was a guy who made a film, and what his film was about was he traveled across the United States from city to city using his credit card. Of course, he always had his phone and on. He was using his credit cards, and he was um, uh, he had a, a private investigator following him, trying to steal his identity. Right? So go and try to find ways that he could get get access to his identity and steal it. But if you think about it, as the carrier who knows a lot about you, they know where you are, you have your device, they know, they know some stuff about you personally, right, that they could leverage. So there's some things that can be done there on the identity side, and, and that was kind of what he was there trying to do, was he came into the all -control. He's like, hey, what can you guys do to help me get access to information about my identity? So some of that stuff is subscriber data, right? Type information. Other questions? No? All right. Excellent. Well, thanks, you guys. And, uh, oh, one other thing. So if you want to play around with these APIs, yes, you can go there and do it. But um, Ross, on Saturday at 3 o'clock, I think? 3.30. 3.30, 3.30, is actually gonna do an hour seminar where he's gonna build an app for you using these things and Yahoo Bikes and uh, build you a quick pull app and have you guys try to create the same application. Um, what we're also gonna do in the next, uh, and that's actually I think it's called the challenge or something like that, and that's 3.30 on Saturday. And then in the next few weeks ahead, we're also gonna announce um, a contest across the campus party. <laughs> Uh, all the campus party activities, so you'll be hearing from us very, very soon around that, because again, we want to know what you want from, from the network and how we can do it. And those of you guys, and I apologize, I should probably start it off by, do you know what all the tell does? Like, you have no idea what the company does. So just as a, as a backup, what we do is we provide all the infrastructure that the carriers use to run their networks. So the boxes that get put behind the walls and runs all the stuff. That's why we want to know what APIs to expose, because when they buy our box, we need to expose it in the software. So we provide all that network infrastructure, and that's why we're here. We want to know what you want exposed. All right, that's it. Thanks, you guys. Have a great day. Enjoy the campus party.